this talk is uh, inspired by an exhibition that took place at the Royal Academy in 2019, 20, beginning of 2020, called The Renaissance New. This is the, um, the exhibition catalogue. And um, what I'm going to do is uh, the talk is inspired by the exhibition, but it's not uh, directly based on the exhibition. But before I begin, I just a little bit of background about the Renaissance. The Renaissance, of course, is um, uh, the period when art was reborn. That's literally what it means and inspired by classical art. Now, there were a number of reasons for that. One of them was that a lot of classical texts were becoming available in Europe, which had been translated in the Arab world and uh, were becoming available uh, generally. Now, of course, Italy was one of the centers both of the classical world, ancient Roman world, uh, but also it was one of the uh, centers for this rebirth in art. And the idea developed of man becoming the center of all things. There were new discoveries, new worlds being discovered and um, classical sculpture was being um, dug up uh, in, in um, the uh, grounds around Rome. This is the um, uh, Laoco one and his sons. And it was dug up in Rome in 1506. And it became one of the most famous classical sculptures ever excavated. It was placed on a public display in the Vatican and, and it's still on public display there to this day. And the human body became a focus in art as it could be used to symbolize many different attributes from motherhood to um, strength, beauty and eroticism and the form and structure of the body took on um, an increasingly symbolic meaning. And what I'm going to do today is to go through some of these um, symbolic meanings of the body thematically and uh, show how the use of the body developed from about 1400 to about 1600. That's the period I'll be covering starting with religion, then mythology, everyday life, and finally the, the use of the body in the erotic. But uh, another background point, I've got uh, this slide and two more slides as a bit of a background. <clears throat> it was um, around the 14th century that um, intellectuals in Italy started to rediscover these writings of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And one of those writers was uh, Protagoras, who was a sophist, that is um, a philosopher or a learned man who for <laughs> an exorbitant fee would teach wealthy young men the art of rhetoric. And this was important because Athens uh, was a litigious society like America is today and lawsuits were common. And those trained in the art of rhetoric knew how to turn a jury and support their claim. So that was one of the um, attributes of the wealthy. And of course, rhetoric is still important today. I think it should be taught more widely in schools. So it enables us to see how we're being manipulated by, by everyone, politicians to advertisers, and if we wish, how to manipulate others and win arguments. Anyway, Protagoras thought truth could be manipulated, but um, Plato, on the other hand, strongly believe that truth was absolute. And um, it, although he didn't believe that truth was um, obvious and he thought that most people or everybody would need to be um, spend years uh, learning the um, truths of philosophy in order to understand and judge what the truth is. But Protagoras believed he could teach his students how to make the worse appear better, in other words, twist the truth. And he argued that even if truth is absolute, each person must decide what's true for themselves, or as he put it, man is the measure of all things. And it's that phrase which has um, become sort of symbolic of 
the Renaissance and humanism, man as the measure of all things. Of course, in the 14th century Italy, uh, with Catholicism had to be rationalized with these classical beliefs. And the, um, the saying man is the measure of all things was understood to apply to the earthly realm. Everyone was fiercely religious and a great deal of effort was put into this squaring of the ancient beliefs with Christianity. But th also the body, the human body, took on a new significance because it was seen to represent God's ultimate creation on earth and the form of God on earth. And here we see Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, revealing one aspect of that perfection. It's a mathematical perfection. And he shows that by showing how the human body is contained with or can be contained within a circle and a square, the two um, platonic uh, forms of a mathematical perfection. The image is called Vitruvian Man, and that's because there was a Roman architect whose um, text on architecture remain, re, was available then. Uh, the Roman architect Vitruvius equated the good design of a building to the form and ratios of the human body. And so he was saying that human bodily proportions are uh, contain um, truth, if you like, or perfection in themselves. And that's what Leonardo is uh, mirroring or showing here. And the comments you can see written around it uh, in his backwards handwriting to disguise it are um, comments on the work of Vitruvius, which is why this image is called Vitruvian Man. Another little setting of the scene. Uh, this is uh, a type of art called International Gothic, produced um, early in the Renaissance period, uh, end of the Middle Ages. And this is um, a medieval image. And I wanted to show you how the body was represented in uh, the medieval prior to the Renaissance at the end of the medieval period. And this is one of the greatest works of British art from the Middle Ages. It's in the National Gallery. It's called, as you probably know, the Wilton Diptych. It was produced, we don't know exactly when, but between 1377 and 1399. And it shows Richard II, who was monarch at that time, being presented to the Virgin Mary, <coughs> who's surrounded by angels. And um, Richard has uh, King Edmund and Edward the Confessor, the figures on the left, who were England's patron saints and his personal patron saint, John the Baptist, the figure on the right, on the left-hand side. You can see um, sort of an amusing, what I regard as an amusing touch, that all the angels are wearing a white heart or stag, which was Richard's em emblem. So he was um, being recognized personally in heaven. This is, um, late medieval as well, called Trey Richard du Duc de Berry. It was produced in the early 15th century, as you can see, 1412 to 16. And it shows everyday life in rural France. It's a book of hours, or it's a page from a book of hours, which was a, a type of prayer book that contained psalms and other prayers. But it, this uh, book of hours also contained a page for each month of the year. And this is the page for February. And um, I, I chose this, um, well, I'll show you in a moment why I chose it, but you can see it's freezing cold. The ground's covered in snow. It was historically, we now know, a time of severe weather. A few years earlier, 1407 to eight, it was the coldest on record up, up to the present day. And in 1409, to 10 that winter, the Thames froze over for 14 weeks. Here we see workers in the field chopping and transporting firewood, and there are three people on the left. Let's uh, enlarge that image, warming themselves in front of a fire. And um, because you can see more closely now, if you look at the couple at the back, I'm partly showing you this because I, I find it amusing, 
but partly because it shows what life was like in the 15th century and partly shows that nudity was an everyday part of life. So let's um, start looking at uh, Renaissance art and the body was used, as I um, said just now, in um, these different ways. It was used to show aspects of the Bible, to represent mythological scenes, which became increasingly important in the uh, Renaissance period from the newly discovered class classical literature, to record the secular everyday events and individuals. I'll talk more about these images later. And portraits, if this is in fact a portrait, I'll discuss that later, and to explore beauty and the erotic. It, there were other uses for the body. I mean, Leonardo uh, did a number of studies of the body, drawings of the body to study anatomy, but I'm not going to be covering some of those other uses today. And uh, the sequence I'll keep today is roughly the sequence we see here on this slide. Now, so to start with the religious, during the medieval period, uh, nearly all art was religious, and there was one biblical event where nudity was required to be shown, and that was the representation of Adam and Eve before the fall. So let's start with that. <clears throat> now, this is um, Lucas Cranach, the elder, Adam and Eve. He painted these works for wealthy patrons, and you can see here there's a balance between what we might call the purely decorative and the lively and natural representation of the human figure. Um, what I mean by that, just to expand on that, by the decorative, I mean um, the gold background we saw um, in medieval, a lot of medieval pictures, um, the uh, inclusion of angels. There's none of that here, but it's still, not completely uh, natural in the representation, it's idealized. So there's a balance here. He found um, this representation of Adam and Eve uh, very popular amongst his patrons, and he produced over 50 versions. So you might have seen some. Uh, this is at the court, oh, there's one in the Louvre. Um, now, all there's lots of animals in this picture and I won't go through them all, but they all, they would have all had at the time a, a didactic or educational function. The, um, the let me see if I point to it, the antlerless um, male uh, roebuck or male roe deer represents the defenseless Christ when he first entered the world. And the, the stag, is a very common symbol of for Christ the Redeemer. Uh, I think Psalm 42 compares the human thirsting after God to a stag in search of water. And um, you can see uh, a stag drinking uh, at the bottom right. And stag, the roe deer was famed for its chastity and its devotion to a single mate. Um, the mature stag with the, the antlers uh, which overlaps Adam's body, probably represents the resurrected Christ. The sheep, you can see at the back, represents the true Christian for whom the Lord is my shepherd. The stork um, was associated with piety, purity and resurrection because they believed it was a prudent creature who only built one nest. So it was used as a metaphor also for the true church, the one and only home for the faithful. And uh, I could go on about the heron, the uh, just to mention the boar and the lion at the back. I, I mention those because they have opposing meanings. So not all these symbols were straightforward. A boar could stand for anger and brutality and lust. But here it's probably intended, it was also used justice, independence and courage. And similarly, the lion was sometimes opposed to the stag and personified the devil. But a friendly lion, as we see here, signified the courage needed to overcome evil. So um, I don't have time to go into all of the symbolism, 
but it would have been understood at the time. And you can see it's not straightforward. It's, um, it depends on the context. Finally, you'll note, well, it's a bit hard to see, but you, you'll see here, there's um, a Cranach's mark and I've expanded it here uh, to uh, show you the, um, the way that um, he uh, represented his, his name. It's, it's a bit hard to see, but it's um, a bat, bat, bat winged serpent with a ring in its mouth. That's the thing underneath. Um, and it's also got the date. Now, the Protestant church um, and the Catholic church disapproved of all, well, the Protestant church disapproved of all religious images and the Catholic church uh, disapproved of images that um, uh, were too um, er erotic. So artists looked for other subjects to earn a living from. And one of those that was popular from uh, Greek mythology was the figure of Aphrodite, which the Romans called Venus. And what, that's what we see here, Venus by, again, Lucas Cranach, the elder, uh, Venus, oh, sorry, Cupid complaining to Venus, the, the, um, the work on the left. The, um, he, Lucas Cranach um, produced a lot of um, erotic themes. He, he produced um, about 20 paintings of Venus in a 20 year period. And it was his most um, successful, that is um, his easiest to sell, if you like, mythological subject. It's actually a story from the classical period. And what we see is Cupid, who was the god of erotic love is complaining to his mother Venus, the goddess of love, that he's been stung by bees after stealing a honeycomb, which he's holding in his hand. Venus doesn't console him, but she's looking out seductively towards us as she grasps the branch of an apple tree. Um, in reference, it, it's, you can see from the last um, picture that there's um, a, ref a reference to Eve. The um, hat by the way she's wearing and also the figure on the right and the choker she has around the neck were uh, fashionable it was the style worn at the saxon court in 1505 which is um where he was working then and so this figure on the left may be an allegory of um the pleasures and pains of love and the warnings of um the dangers of love. Possibly some people have suggested a warning about venereal disease. At the top right, I mean, it's very difficult to see, but you can see there's some writing at the top right of the left-hand figure. It reads, as Cupid, in Latin, but translated it reads, as Cupid was stealing honey from the hive, a bee stung the thief on the finger. And so do we seek transitory and dangerous pleasures that are mixed with sadness and bring us pain. So there's a moral message in the background of these pictures. Uh, as a side note, um, this figure on the left is possibly, or we think, the one purchased by Adolf Hitler using the royalties he received from Mein Kampf because we, we know that or believe that because there's a photograph showing it in his private collection. Now, after the war, an American war correspondent was allowed to select one work from a warehouse in Southern Germany, which was guarded by American soldiers. And he took it back, sold it in New York, and it was bought by the National Gallery in 1963, um, later. And um, it's, uh, th that's how it came to be in the National Gallery. The, uh, the rock, by the way, uh, by her foot, again, contains the serpent symbol of Lucas Cranach. And there's also um, another one. The figure on the right is, I just wanted to show you another example, and this one's in the Louvre. 
Um, there's also um, Kranich's symbol at that. If you can, if you can spot it down there, I think you ought to be able to. I said down there, so you should um, see it down. If I expand that part of the picture, it's got the date and um, another, again, still quite difficult to interpret, but another example of this back winged serpent that was his um, device he used. Now, there are other stories in the Bible that involve naked figures. One of the most uh, popular was um, Bathsheba. And the story is that King David, while walking on the roof of his palace, saw a beautiful woman bathing. He ordered inquiries and found out she was called Bathsheba and was the wife of Uriah. And David desired her and arranged for Uriah to be killed in battle. He sent him to the, the front in the battle um, and he was killed in battle. David later made her pregnant and a, a lot of the, um, the detail of that story is shown in the right hand picture in the, in the side panels. Uh, but what I, um, the interesting thing I think, the reason I'm showing these two is that one of the images uh, and that they're from prayer books, one of the images it was produced for a woman and one for a man. And I wondered if you, I'm not putting up the title so that you can sort of work out in your own mind which you think, which is which. I'll tell you now by putting up the title. The one on the left was produced for Anne of France. And in this picture, the woman is meant to understand that men are such weak creatures that even a hint of flesh is sure to drive them to even the greatest of men like King David into uh, passionate and deviant behavior. So it's, it's the weakness of men here. And uh, the one on the right was um, produced for Claude Mollet, who was a, a lord, um, uh, Ville de Marachal near Troyes, and he was, um, th this, this was the, the form that was usually used for the male, and, and typically it was a male audience. Uh, the story understood by men was substantially different. Woman is a seductress, so it's best to stay away and not even glance in her direction. In other words, in the, in the one, it's the, the man at fault, and the other, it's the woman at fault. Uh, we don't know from the Bible uh, whether she was aware that King David was um, looking at her from the roof of his palace. The um, Bible doesn't tell us the, the one on the left, interestingly, she seems to be looking slyly. In other words, it implies that she did know she was being looked at. The other image from the Bible is penitent Magdalene. And I, um, she, she's often shown partly draped. And she is the woman in the Bible who traveled with Jesus and was one of his followers, was a witness to his crucifixion and its aftermath. And she's mentioned more times in the Bible than any of the apostles and more than any other woman in the gospels other than Jesus's family. Um, now, you might be thinking of Mary Magdalene as a reformed prostitute, but um, that didn't, uh, that, that understanding didn't take place until a sermon that was given by Pope Gregory I in 591, uh, some time ago. Uh, so, but we still think of Mary Magdalene that way. And Pope Greg Gregory, we believe, made a mistake. He, we think, confused Mary Magdalene, who was introduced in Luke chapter eight, with Mary of Bethany in Luke 10, and the unnamed sinful woman who anointed Jesus's feet in Luke chapter seven. He combined them all together into a single Mary, who um, uh, was uh, therefore a, a reformed prostitute, a sinful woman, although Mary Magdalene in the Bible was not, but, 
but it's become conflated together. And so this has resulted in a widespread belief, which is shown, uh, possibly shown here, but I'll give you another interpretation. It's a repentant prostitute or, or uh, possibly a promiscuous woman. But um, Vasari, the biographer uh, who wrote Lives of the Artist, the um, 16th century biographer of the Renaissance artists, he wrote that erotic though it is, a nudity refers to a medieval legend that her clothes fell apart during the 30 years she spent repenting in the desert after the ascension of Jesus. And in fact, most of the depictions of Mary Magdalene show her with no clothing on, partly covered by her hair or sometimes a loose wrap. Um, so it comes from that medieval text, the golden legend, which um, maintained that she, I mean, it's not in the Bible, but maintained she spent 30 years in the desert. The interpretation there was that she was um, repentant, she was fed by singing angels, and her lack of clothing symbolizes her abandonment of jewels and gold and worldly goods because of her faith in Christ. That's how the golden legend presents it. But I think um, artists in the Renaissance uh, often used it as a, a way of um, uh, showing the um, naked or semi-naked body. And, and we can actually see here that she's conforming with a lot of the uh, fashionable uh, aspects of beauty during uh, the Renaissance uh, in Italy. The uh, golden hair was a one of the desirable attributes of a slightly fleshy body and full lips and so on. So this version of Mary Magdalene happens to correspond with the Renaissance um, uh, fashionable ideas of beauty. Now, this is a very early and in some ways the earliest bronze sculpture of a biblical figure, in this case, the hero David who is naked except for his helmet and boots. By the way, his hat, which to me looks a bit like a sort of summer hat with flowers on as worn by women, is um, a hat with laurel wreaths around it because he's the victor. It's in Florence, it's in the Bargello in Florence. And uh, just to remind you, the Philistines were fighting the Israelites, but before starting battle, they offered a single combat to determine the whole battle so there wouldn't need to be a battle and they put up their champion Goliath who none of the Israelite soldiers was brave enough to fight they thought they would lose and therefore lose the battle but David a shepherd came forward he was too young to be a soldier he refused to wear any armor it says in the bible and um, Donatello has interpreted that as refusing to wear any clothes at all but the bible doesn't say that he went into combat with just his sling, and that thing in his left hand is a stone. And he knocked Goliath unconscious, ran forward and cut off his head using Goliath's own sword, which he's holding here, and Goliath's head is underneath his foot. This is the first unsupported bronze statue, and bronze was very unusual in the Renaissance because it was so expensive. This is the first freestanding male nude sculpture since the classical period. Um, so it's very early. It's, we believe it was commissioned by Cosimo de Medici. And according to Vasari, it stood on a column in the middle of the courtyard of the Palazzo Medici. The, um, the boy is physically delicate and we would say effeminate. And we think this is to show how he didn't overcome Goliath through strength. He could only overcome him through God's power working through the boy. So his nakedness implies the presence of God and suggests innocence and purity. It was later placed, um, moved from the palazzo to the town hall, which indicates it wasn't controversial at the time. Having said all of that, as you might imagine, later historians, art historians have suggested that 
based on this statue that Donatello was homosexual and ex expresses his sexual attitude. I, I'm not sure about that. I, incidentally, in Renaissance Italy, uh, sodomy was illegal, but in Florence, which had a population of some 40,000, um, over 17,000 men were tried for this crime and nearly all of them, I think all of them except for a couple of dozen, uh, were uh, fined and it was called the tax on sodomy and uh, Florence was well known for um, that and the um, of the few dozen most of them were put in prison. I, th I think only one or two were actually executed. So we don't know. I, I mentioned that just to show the ambiguities that surround this picture. I'll let you form your own judgment after I've given you, you know, some of the background information. And then um, there was the naked body used to represent the damned. Usually, although in the next example, um, it's not the case, but usually the, um, the saved on the day of judgment are shown partly clothed and the damned are shown naked. This is a painting 1470 by Derek Bouts called The Fall of the Damned or Hell. And it was at one stage thought to be part of a last judgment triptych, three paintings, but we now think this was intended to stand alone. So it's a standalone painting of um, the damned falling into hell. And here, nakedness is used to represent shame. And there's some evidence that um, these figures had a semi-humorous aspect in the sense of, look what happens to you if you aren't good. Um, and notice that some of the demons, and in fact, some of the damned are looking out at us to remind us, the viewer, of the torments, torments that lie ahead if we don't keep on the path of righteousness. Incidentally, artists were encouraged to represent the damned in the with the most horrific sufferings that they could imagine. So artists went out of their way to use their imagination to invent new forms of suffering uh, and that was encouraged by the church. The um, last judgment in the same, the Sistine Chapel, the end wall of the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo, painted um, some years later than the ceiling. And it shows the good, mostly on the left, rising to heaven and the damned and on the right, the bottom right, descending to hell. Now, the reason I'm showing this, and there's a lot to say about this uh, fresco, but um, the point I wanted to bring out was that the master of ceremonies at the Vatican opposed the work because he thought it was unworthy of a church. And he described it as suited for public baths and taverns. And the, uh, a bit later, starting in 1545, the Council of Trent, which was formed with the, by the uh, learned and leading members of the Catholic Church to decide how to respond to Protestantism. And it was uh, decided that art, which was banned by the Protestants, um, should be used in the Catholic Church to inspire and show the emotions uh, to, to the um, to, to, to the people, and um, but such art should not arise arouse carnal desire, is the way they put it. Now, the year after Mike, Michelangelo died, it was decided to censor some of the figures of the Last Judgment. And in, let me show you a close up. The censorship was carried out by one of his students, his um, most dedicated student, Daniela de Volterra, uh, who initially refused to do the work, 
but they told him the fresco would be destroyed unless he painted in the um, or, or paint, painted cloths, uh, mostly to cover ma male genitals. Uh, luckily, there was a copy made before the censorship, so we know what Michelangelo actually paint, uh, how he painted it. But it is a copy, and I'll, I'll put up, uh, I'll indicate uh, what he painted, and you, you can see in the copy, which is this small, and, and I can't get a larger. Uh, you, you need to go to the Museo di Ca Capi di Monte in Naples to see the original, and um, he has. Um, covered in a lot of the figures and I maybe I haven't got them all but I, I've marked a lot of them so you see it's not everybody but it's a, a number of the figures and the, perhaps the biggest change is the figures on the right hand side and let me put up the original here where I've got a larger version now this uh, larger version here was the original that Michelangelo painted and it shows Saint Blaise leaning over a naked Saint Catherine. And this was changed to the way you see it to the right of that, which is how you see it today, which Saint Blaise is looking back on looking up and uh, Saint Catherine is clothed. So that was one of the, um, the biggest changes made. Now let's look a bit about the moving on from the Bible to the mythological. As I said, a lot of uh, texts were uncovered uh, or, or discovered in the Arab, Arab world where they've been translated. And the educated were now familiar with these stories. And this is an early representation of a Greek myth where Actium accidentally comes across the goddess Diana while she's bathing. And as a punishment, he turns, she, sorry, she turns him into a stag and his hunting dogs turn on him and kill him. Now, the reason I'm putting up this um, work is you can see it was by a woman artist, Christine de Pisa. She was a poet, a famous poet and author at the time in the, the court of King Charles VI of France, and she translated Ovid's Metamorphoses, which is where the story comes from, and the way she interprets the story, and, and as is shown in this picture here, is that the women in her translation are given equal standing with the men. So, for example, Actium comes across Diana bathing, but all of her assistants are clothed and trying to hide her. She covers herself with a pose that suggests a um, something that I'll be referring to later, the Venus Pudica, which is a pose from um, ancient uh, Greek uh, sculpture. The original is lost, but there's lots and lots of copies. And the pose is where the woman is putting up one hand, her right hand across her breast, and the other hand usually is covering her genitals, um, is a bit higher here in this picture. And so um, we can compare this with um, a version produced, which probably you're much more familiar with, by Titian some, uh, what's that, 150 years later, uh, where he's given free reign to the expression of female flesh. So this is the um, uh, the, the freedom that um, developed during the Renaissance period to show the, the naked body. And he's chosen the moment when Actian accidentally comes across Diana and we see her and all of her attendants naked. And in fact, she seems to be raising her arm to expose her body more fully. I mean, there's a piece of cloth she's holding, but she seems to be lifting it up. And um, Action looks, I think, uh, surprised and fearful. Uh, not surprising. This is an earlier work by Botticelli, The Birth of Venus, uh, one of the best known works I'm probably going to be showing you today, except perhaps for the last work I'm going to show you. <coughs> It was painted in Florence and it's um, 
telling the story from uh, ancient Greek myths of um, Venus, or as the Greeks called her Aphrodite, who was born from the foam of the sea. Um, it was actually the semen from the severed genitals. Sorry to get so uh, um, basic here, but this is the story um, of the genitals of the Titan Uranus, who had been castrated by his son Kronos. I won't go into any more uh, detail, but that's, off, that's why you see or often see um, Aphrodite born across the sea and the, uh, the waves and the foam of the sea. The, um, it, it's a very unusual, this, in showing, you, you'll notice the, the, again, the Venus pudica or modest Venus pose. It would have been known by Botticelli because there were classical um, statues. I mean, this one I'm showing here with um, from the ancient world was found in Rome in 580 AD. So it was a, a well-known, statues like this were um, well-known. Um, there are many, just as a side point, there are many explanations for the pose. And the most obvious one, maybe you're thinking, is modesty. Uh, one that interests me is that the see, coming across a god or goddess at a moment not of their choosing, naked or otherwise, just coming across them had dire consequences, as we saw from uh, what happened to Actaeon, eaten by his hounds. Um, so it's possible that Aphrodite is concealing her nudity to protect us, the viewer, because of the power of her body, if exposed fully to us, would lead to our ruin. You might also be wondering about um, Fra Savonarola, because um, he was in Florence about this time, um, speaking out against images just, such as this, but actually it was a few years, it was about 1490 he went to Florence and this was finished at the, in four years earlier. And he preached against um, artistic excess as he called it. And he, within five years, he would be hosting the phrase you might've heard of bonfire of the vanities. He every, uh, or on a regular basis, he would have big bonfires in Florence where he would burn irreplaceable manuscripts, um, ancient sculptures, modern paintings, musical instruments, all sorts of um, things that he deemed to be uh, vanities. It's said that Botticelli did burn several of his paintings, but we have no evidence for that, so it's not clear. He certainly obviously didn't burn this one. Um, in 1498, so three years after he started the bonfire of the vanities, he was condemned by the church as a heretic and um, hanged and burned in the main square in Florence. Uh, needless to say, that was Savonarola, not Botticelli. This is um, an interesting figure. It's a, in this case, it's Ulm, it's, it's um, a German. It's cabinet sized. It's um, about 16 centimeters high of an elderly woman. Now, it, we now call it elderly bather. Uh, over the centuries, it was called nasty old woman. Um, I don't think it was called that originally. She's stepping towards us with her right hand uh, grasping the fabric of her tur turban. And it, it's uh, again a Venus pudica pose. Now, there was a tradition at the time in southern Germany of displaying withered bodies and desiccated corpses, often paired with images of youth. And the purpose was religious to remind the viewer of the transience of life. And if you, if you look at the back view of the woman, it's more youthful. So it could be that as you turn, turn around this figure or walk around the figure, you're reminded of the transience of youth in a single figure and 
the shortness of life for us all. <clears throat> Another sort of secular figure, this is a group of bathers, and you might be surprised bathhouses were quite common. You might be imagining that in this period, 1470, that no one bathed. Um, in fact, bathing was quite common, bathhouses were common, um, but the reason they, the church warned against bathing was not because they thought it was harmful to your health, but it was a, bathhouses were places where orgies took place, as we can uh, see here. And, and often um, uh, a brothel would have a bathhouse with in, inside it. So bathing was common, but associated with um, sexual excess, um, but, but not all bathhouses. So um, the, um, it, it has been suggested that it's a representation of a story by a Roman author called Valerius Maximus uh, concerning Hannibal's army um, and their wasteful pleasures. And the, in this interpretation, Valerius Maximus, the, the author, uh, is standing in the doorway discussing the uh, wasteful excesses of Hannibal's army with Emperor Tiberius, the one you see with a crown. And the text of this book uh, was dedicated to um, uh, Tiberius. The um, medieval, uh, the, 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 it's, I think it's um, likely though that this is, um, well, I can't explain the kingly figure in the background, but I think this is likely to represent what many bathhouses were like and it's a warning against the excessive use of bathhouses. Another warning, and this one needs a little explaining. The, um, it's, it's called Aristotle and Phyllis. It was produced by Hans Baldon, so it's Northern European. It's late 15th, early 16th century. And it's the theme associated with this, the, the theme at the, the, the popular theme at the time, that is around the early 16th century, was something called, that we call today, the power of women. Uh, that doesn't mean women had power, it meant that men started to restrict women's behavior, which had been freer before this, they, were, they reduced women's legal and economic rights, restricted women's right to work, outlawed practices that were previously allowed, such as prostitution. Uh, so there are a number of reasons why this change started to take place. It was sexual in nature, of course, this belief in the power of women. And um, it was reinforced or it was supported by um, stories and pictures from the Bible, such as Delilah betraying Samson, Eve seducing Adam, and so on, but also images from classical mythology, such as this one, which is sometimes called Phyllis, debasing Aristotle, which gives you a better idea of what's going on here. Although, um, well, let me tell you the story. Uh, the great philosopher, the great Greek philosopher Aristotle, became aware of the charms of a woman called Phyllis. And he told his pupil Alexander, who later became Alexander the Great, to avoid her. This annoyed Phyllis, who found out he was warning Alexander. And she decided to get her revenge. And she knew that Aristotle, in, in modern parlance, fancied her and was, or, or if you like, captivated by her charms. And she told him, that if she was allowed to dominate him by getting him to wear a horse's bridle and to ride him around the courtyard, she would spend the night with him. But she also arranged, unknown to Aristotle, for Alexander to watch him from a hiding place. And I'll leave you to find Alexander in this picture. 
and she rode him around, it's alleged, and Alexander and Phyllis ended up laughing at Aristotle. So it shows the weakness of men, even great philosophers, or if you like, turning it around, the power of women, which is the way this story was used in the early 16th century to support this argument that women should be restricted a lot further because of their power. Incidentally, this story of Aristotle and Phyllis doesn't come from uh, Greek myth, Greek um, original. It originated in France and Germany in the 13th century, but it fed into this story, this theme of the power of women. Um, and it was also used to not only to restrict women, to support stories of witches and witchcraft or now, witchcraft, it's a long story, it goes right back to uh, the witches of Enso, it goes right back to the Bible and, and probably even earlier. And so I'm not saying that witches were invented at this period, but they suddenly in the 15th century became fashionable is not the right word, but um, they became, they, they exercised men um, much more, although one of the earliest example of what was called a witch so was, a, was a monk, a man. Uh, so I should maybe say men or women, but became associated with, with women. And it also became more and more a, of a concern to men that there were witches around doing bad things to men. And one of the artists, artists started to um, illustrate these, these ideas, um, partly I think because they could show naked women. It was an excuse, if you like. So witches became, uh, for, at one point, they, at, at the time these were produced, it was a bit like, um, uh, maybe an exaggerating a point, but it was a bit like a horror film is today. You, you go there, or in this case, you look at the images to be scared about the power of women, but also you quite enjoy uh, the experience. He wasn't, Baldwin wasn't the only or first artist to depict witches, but he, uh, Dürer, for example, did, but he was the first to specialise in the subject. He was, if you wanted a picture of women, women of witches, you'd go to Baldwin. Um, the sexuality of women became linked in this period through the power of women to the devil, and the key book, I think, was produced in 1487 and it was called, um, translated, The Hammer of Witches, the Malleus Maleficarum, The Hammer of Witches. And a quote from that book is, all witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which in women is insatiable. Now the book was initially banned by the Catholic Church. Incidentally, in the earlier Middle Ages, Catholic Church refused to recognize which, which is, they said it was just superstition. Um, but this book, which was originally condemned by the church, became an, an important source text, which was used to justify the increasingly brutal persecution of witches in the 16th and 17th century. There's something particularly tragic, I think, about the myth of witches over a 300 year period from about the time these pictures were produced, some 40,000 people, mostly women, were tortured, burnt at the stake, hung or beheaded. And there were an even greater number, we don't even know the number, of victims who were lynched, assaulted, ostracized, persecuted in various ways. As one historian has written, there are no pages of human history more filled with horror than those which record the witch madness of these centuries. Slightly more lighthearted here, but continuing the theme of the power of women, uh, the notion of love magic or a love potion. And this became popular at the time, this idea and the use of love potions and the use of magic to create sexual passion or romantic love. It, it, 
the, the idea of love potions wasn't new to this period. It goes back to ancient Egypt and through the classical world, through the Middle Ages. Um, but it took on a particular form at this time. And this um, painting illustrates that. So during the Renaissance, it was believed that magic of any form could harm the caster of the magic as much as the person the magic was being performed to influence. So it wasn't undertaken lightly. And the usual conclusion of love magic was um, to marry a man or woman of higher social rank who would otherwise, her or her, her family in particular, would um, reject marriage to a lower rank social person. Now, spells were meant to be secret, but by letting the victim become aware that you were cast in the spell, it was believed it became more effective. And in this painting, the naked woman who incidentally, her open-toed slippers, uh, which look a bit odd, were in fact the fashion at the time this was produced. She's got a thin, very thin veil around her, but notice the casket at her side, the thing inside it is a heart. And what she's doing is she's striking a steel in her left hand um, against a flint to create a shower of sparks. And she's also dropping drops of water from a sponge at the same time onto the heart, which th th this indicates, and, and the magic strengthens, it promotes this, that um, she can inflame the heart and extinguish the flame at her choice. There are a lot of erotic symbols in this, obviously the naked body, the roses on the floor, the parrot, um, the casket, which is a metaphor for the, the woman's body. Now, the way I've been speaking, it's and, and this picture suggests that it's something that women did to attract men, but historians now believe it was actually the other way round. Men said that it was women that were casting spells on them, but actually we now believe that young men targeting women of a higher social rank were the main ones to practice love magic in this period. So this painting is something that supports this um, uh, uh, men trying to blame women for the use of um, love magic, but it was actually the other way around. So moving on. How are we doing for time? Yes, call for an hour. In the first decade of the 16th century, Giorgione and Titian pioneered a new type of image we see here called um, La, Bo La Bella Donne. They were, well, we don't really know, but they were idealized images of beautiful women. They weren't, re they weren't meant to be real people. Whether they were real people is a subject of much speculation. They could be courtesans, it could be a fiance or a wife, or simply an idealized version of beauty personified. The woman here is called idealized portrait of a courtesan as Flora. Now Flora was an ancient um, uh, Greek goddess and the way that she's holding the flowers indicates she is Flora and therefore a Greek goddess. And in a sense that sort of made the image more acceptable because it was, um, mythological image, but this idea of um, the beautiful woman um, took on, uh, it became very popular paintings of this, um, of beautiful women, and they were usually half length, um, usually one or both breasts exposed, sometimes holding a bouquet of flowers. But we also know that um, Bartolomeo Veneto um, you, we, we believe she was a model that he used because I'll just show you very quickly a, um, a picture, a, a detail of a painting he did of the Virgin Mary in a painting of the circumcision of Jesus, just to show you that it's now believed it's the same model. That's what I'm showing you here. So it's a model he used and therefore he, what he was doing is he was just an idealized image of beauty 
um, and he was just using his standard model as the basis for uh, this idealized beauty. The, this idea of idealized beauty also comes from Petrarch and his description of Laura, who um, had blonde hair, white skin, rosy lips, and a modest glaze, gaze. Sorry. Another example of the same idea, this is Giorgione Laura, a portrait of a young bride, suggesting that this in fact is a bride, but we, it seems in some ways unlikely that um, a, someone wealthy enough to have a painting uh, done would be of a social class that would allow their bride to be shown uh, semi-naked. Uh, women were increasingly in this period, partly as a consequence of the power of women, were increasingly uh, locked away, not allowed out without a companion, had to wear a veil and so on. Um, she's wearing an undershirt or um, camicha, as it was called, a uh, red mantle trimmed with fur. The undergarment incidentally was trimmed, uh, sorry, was worn to protect the expensive clothing from um, body oils and sweat, but of course they weren't normally seen. They were made from fine linen. Uh, it doesn't appear on the other hand to have been idealized, suggesting that maybe it is a portrait. Now in 1506, we know there was only one woman um, called Laura married in Venice at the time, and that was Laura Donna. And so some suggest that this was um, a companion portrait, maybe kept privately of this man who Giorgione also painted at um, the same time. So they're companion uh, pieces of the um, uh, bride and bridegroom. But it's still unusual that a um, Venetian lady would agree to be painted with a bare breast. So we, we don't know. Well, there's a lot to say about this one, but I'll try and keep it short. Um, Gustave Flaubert wrote, she is a beautiful woman, no need to know more. So I could keep it short and just move on, but uh, you might want to know a bit more about uh, Raphael. So let me skip on and uh, talk about, and, and just quickly run through the five interpretations of this painting. Um, first of all, it's um, a bella donna, a beautiful woman. It's Raphael's version of this increasingly popular subject made popular by Giorgione and Titian. And um, he may have used a model for it. Second interpretation is that it's actually his lover and we know he had a lover. We, and to add evidence to that, she's wearing an armband. As you can see, and you might be able to read it, it says Raphael Urbinis, um, suggesting it is a portrait of his muse and mistress, Margarita Luti. Now, she is said to have turned down his proposals of marriage uh, which he made every time they met. She never married him. She eventually left him and he fell into despair and refused to paint. So his patron, in fact, two of his patrons, but his patron, Pope Louis X, sorry, Pope, Pope, Pope Leo X, Leo X, bribed her to disappear for good and then arranged some story to tell Raphael to explain why she would never come back to get him to paint again, which he did. An interesting interpretation, a very different interpretation of this is from an article in The Lancet, uh, the medical journal in 2002. A doctor analyzed this picture and said she has a possible tumor on her left breast, a left breast indicated by the shadow um, around or, or just continuing on from her index finger. And can you see that the left breast has, um, it's a bit difficult to tell in this reproduction, but it has a slightly bluer color than her right breast. And again, it's 
difficult to see, but um, her uh, left arm is also swollen, um, possibly because um, uh, the tumor has uh, blocked the lymph glands. So the doctor went into detail analyzing this. It, it's possible it's a medical journal, but um, I don't know. Um, I, I'll leave it for you to decide. It's what I always say. It, it's also possible that this is a representation of a witch um, because of, there's a convoluted explanation, but um, Raphael's uh, lover, Margarita Luti, was called Forarina, which means um, Baker's daughter. And in Shakespeare's Hamlet, Ophelia said, they say the owl was a baker's daughter. And the reason Ophelia says that is there's an ancient Greek um, legend that um, the, I won't go into the full story, but um, a, an owl goddess was a witch and servant of what later became identified with Satan. And um, the, uh, so for Narina, some people think that Raphael's lover was simply a baker's daughter. Some think the, um, the title was because she was associated with witchcraft. Um, final explanation is it simply um, a sex worker, a prostitute that Raphael used as a model um, for um, which ties in with the uh, Belladonna interpretation. And the uh, evidence for that, there's evidence for each of these explanations, was that prostitutes at the time were required to wear a yellow scarf around the head, and she's wearing a yellow scarf, and it was only prostitutes that wore them. And someone, a woman wearing a yellow scarf, um, was allowed to pose naked as a model without being prosecuted. And in other words, a lot of the models that were used were um, prostitutes, courtesans. And if they weren't, it was actually illegal for the woman to pose naked. Uh, how long have I got? Have I got? Let me move on quickly through the next couple of pictures. This is interesting because the naked man and woman are on the back of the conventional portrait of the man on the left. And we don't know what it signifies. The woman's gazing in a hand mirror. The man, let's say, tries to get her attention. The bottom right, astonishingly, there's a, a sprig in a glass of water that looks like a detail from a modern conceptual work, a modern painting. The painting generally defies interpretation. There's been no satisfactory interpretation of what it's about. At one level, it's erotic, but their expression suggests sadness. Perhaps it's a moral lesson. Perhaps it's um, a lesson against illicit affairs because the, the, well, the laurel again has many symbolic meanings. It can, as we've seen earlier with um, Donatello's David, that it could mean victory. Uh, but it was put on your poet, you would put laurel on your pillow to gain poetic inspiration. It was associated with uh, immortality, it was a symbol of peace, um, but it was also a symbol, and maybe that's the meaning here, uh, to indicate the power one has over one's passions or the lack of them. So may maybe it's a moral uh, lesson on the back, we don't know. Um, I work, this is um, said to be Simonetta Vespucci, uh, who was known as the greatest beauty of her age. In fact, when she died, she died aged 22 of tuberculosis. When her coffin was taken through the city, it was left open so everyone could admire her beauty for the last time. Some people say she was um, the uh, inspiration for the Venus in Birth of Venus that we saw earlier of Botticelli, by Botticelli. And the, the bare breasts are seen at the time as a reference to um, a chaste Venus. The snakes are maybe a reference to Cleopatra um, or an allusion to her death from consumption because this was painted after her death. And her name appears 
on, on the bottom in Latin form. Finally, uh, uh, the final uh, Bella Donna, Donne, um, is by Palma Vecchio, who became well known for painting them a bit later. And she has all the conventional attributes we've seen before. Um, long fingers, large forehead, small ears, small breasts, fine eyebrows were other features of the beautiful woman at the time. And we can see the same woman is in another painting by his. So it's likely a model again that he used. And um, so probably a courtesan. My final three images start with this remarkable drawing uh, by Pisanello, and it's the earliest surviving Renaissance reclining nude. I'll show you two more in a moment. Pisanello was one of the most distinguished painters of the early Italian Renaissance, uh, employed, his patron was the Doge of Venice and the Pope in the Vatican, and he was employed in by the courts of Verona, Ferrara, Mantua, Milan, Rimini, and the King of Naples. So he was held in high esteem. Now we think, we don't know, we think that this is an allegory of lust represented by the hair. And her, it, notice her body is fairly thin, a bony body, wasn't um, fashionable at the time. Um, so that's opposed to the women we've seen earlier. So it suggests that Pisanello is um, uh, pointing out the um, dangers of lust, the wantonness of lust, and the inability of lustful thoughts to offer true satisfaction. Been various. Uh, interpretations of that sort. But moving on um, to one of the earliest um, reclining, uh, in this case, uh, Venus's uh, reclining nudes. Uh, this is by Giorgione, or some people think it's by Titian, but um, let's say it's by Giorgione. And it's um, painted at the end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century, we think. And it's, we think it's the first um, simple depiction of a nude figure shown in a straightforward way. It's called Sleeping Venus, but there's no attributes of Venus. There's no Cupid. There's nothing to show that it's a, a goddess. It's a break from that tradition. It's a new subject for the artist. Uh, resulting up into the 20th century of reclining nudes of Henry Moore and Francis Bacon and so on. This is where it began with this uh, figure by Giorgione. And the erotic, it's intentionally erotic and erotic, erotic works became increasingly subjects for art in the 16th century in Italy. And this was a period, remember, when women were expected to cover themselves, as I said, with face veils um, uh, and locked away at home, etc. It um, the taste for the erotic grew through the century, and mythology was used as a loophole to make the subjects acceptable. Or as you, but as you can see here, there weren't many attributes or any attributes of Venus. And my final work, perhaps the most famous I'm showing today, is the Venus of Urbino, painted by Titian in 1534, traditionally identified as Venus, but it's anyone's guess. Um, it's also been seen as a portrait of a courtesan, suggested it was a courtesan called Angela de Moro or Ange Angela Zaffetta. Um, it's also been suggested that it's a painting celebrating a marriage of the person who first owned this painting, who may or may not have commissioned it. Um, it was intent, we don't know if it was intended to be Venus. In the background, incidentally, is a, 
a typical uh, room, Italian room of the period of when it was painted. And we see uh, two servants looking in a cassone, which is a chest in which typically uh, the marriage um, trousseau was kept. So that suggests it's uh, a uh, to do with um, a marriage. The dog also represents fidelity and the fact that it's quiet and not barking suggests the person looking um, that we, the viewer, um, are the owner of the painting and of the room and so on. Night is falling. It's been, uh, there's been many interpretations over the centuries, but I just wanted to finish with a slight twist and to read a quote from Mark Twain, who called it the foulest, the vilest, the obscenest picture the world possesses. He proposed it was painted for a brothel and it was probably refused because it was a trifle too strong. He added humorously, in truth, it's a trifle too strong for any place other than a public art gallery.